over the years, I've had the opportunity and privilege to interview a, a lot of men who served in World War II. And uh, a, a common thread that I've heard from the guys who served in the European Theater of Operations uh, was just how well trained the German infantryman was uh, the, that they fought against. And um, uh, another thing that, that I've heard from a lot of these guys is, is just how fanatical and, and really what the word I'm thinking of that, that has been used uh, to describe it to me is just mean uh, the the men from the SS were. Well, here at the Gettysburg Museum of History, uh, they, they have a lot of items here that, that teach us about the history of the German military during World War II. Today we're gonna to be looking at a couple of artifacts. One from uh, a gentleman who was in the army and another one who was in the SS, both of which had uh, differing paths. So I'm going to tell you about two German groupings from two different German military soldiers who had very different fates in World War II. And the first one is an SS soldier named Helmut Borchett. And Helmut Borchett grew up in Germany and joined the Hitler Youth. And here is a photograph of him in his Hitler Youth uniform. And like most German kids, he was a member. And this is another interesting photo of him with some of his Hitler Youth buddies. And when he turned 18, he started working in a factory for the war effort. We have his workbook here. And he managed to stay out of the military for a little while. But then he was drafted. He was actually drafted into the SS. Um, when the SS's numbers started to fall, they actually drafted. You know, people think that they were all just volunteer, and that's not true. They they dra drafted people, or maybe it was they drafted and they had a choice of going into the SS or the army. But he he went into the SS, and here is a picture of him with his parents right here when he was getting ready to leave for for active duty, and. Here is another photograph of him at the earliest rank, and he has a, a SS crusher style visor cap on. And still another photo of him with an overseas cap on. And you can see the SS ruins here and the Totenkopf insignia on his hat. So he went into uh, active service as a combat soldier, frontline combat, and he went to the Eastern Front. And he was in combat for about two weeks when he was killed in action on the Eastern Front. And his comrades snapped a photograph of his grave, and that's his helmet up there, and the, the SS grave with the arrow pointing up like that. And they sent home to his par parents this photograph and some flowers that were on his grave and his parents made this memorial in, in, in a frame. So when you were killed on the Eastern Front, they would try to send your personal effects home. And so these items were placed in a box and it was sent back to his parents. And it looks to me like there was a photo album because there was a whole bunch of snapshots of him at various stages of his service. Um, and some of them have back marks that they may have been in a photo album. And there's also a whole box of letters that he had written or had gotten written, was written to him that were sent home. And um, it's, it's just really an interesting group that, you know, all this stuff, this guy's life basically is in this box. This is all the, the notice that went into the newspaper about his death. You know, parent, the parents would take out ads about uh, about deaths, and you see those quite often. And there's there's a little 1944 uh, pocket diary with not too many entries in there. 
and and we we actually got this from another museum over in over in uh, Belgium. It, it came out of Belgium, but he was from Germany. But you don't see things like this in the United States. You know, most of the things that we get over here are items that were brought back by U.S. soldiers. You know, war trophies, and this is a very personal uh, archive of of this SS man helmet Borchette, and um, he was killed. And you just it's, it's interesting to see something like this in, in, in the United States. to show a few more of these items up close so uh, this one here says Deutschreich Kindkarte and I'm a professional at mispronouncing things so if I got that wrong then then I apologize but this was just kind of like a, a general ID book that they had during the Third Reich era uh, so here we can see a picture of this individual we see his his fingerprints um, and then just some some biographical information. I don't read German very well, so I can't really make out exactly what all of that is saying. And then again, we go over here and look at a picture of him as a young guy whenever he was in the Hitler Youth. And then pictures whenever he was a little bit older getting into the SS. And then here are a few more photos. So again, here's a picture of him in the Hitler Youth, uh, which you can kind of think of as like, sort of like a Boy Scouts type organization, only um, <laughs> a, a little bit more problematic, uh, to say the least. And then here are a few other pictures. You can see him kind of goofing around in this picture. And uh, whenever you look at this, I mean, obviously the, the SS, man, they were some of the worst of the worst in World War II and, and did some terrible things. But whenever you look at him as a young guy, ah, man, it just kind of makes you sad that, uh, that this is where he ended up. I'm going to show you a second grouping from a German army soldier. His name was Herbert Vogts, and his fate was a little bit different than the SS man we just uh, visited. Uh, he uh, was in the army, he was in the infantry, and again, he was in the Eastern Front also. And this is his helmet, and this has got some camouflage material on it, um, but the most striking feature and also I want to show you it has his name in there Vogues and but the most striking feature of this helmet or most interesting feature is it has a big ding in it and what had happened to him was when he was on the Eastern Front a piece of Soviet shrapnel crashed through his helmet barely missing his face, scraping his face, but didn't damage it too bad. But it kept going and landed in his leg, and he had a severe leg wound. And <clears throat> that, that put him into a hospital and took him out of the war. Um, but some of the other things we have, this is his infantry assault badge. Now it looks bronze, but it's actually silver. You can see some of the silver wash on the back. It's a hollow back version, um, but it's the infantry assault badge. And then this is his Iron Cross second class that came with the grouping. And this is his soul book. And there's a good wartime photograph of him and he's wearing that the ribbon for the Iron Cross Seconds class in that photograph. And this is a photograph of him with his family, his mother and father and other family members. And there's a lot of paperwork with this grouping, <clears throat> including letters home and there's even a letter to his mother describing his wound and he is minimalizing the effects of that wound, trying to calm his mother. So how did this get to the Gettysburg Museum of History? He survived the war, 
Um, and uh, I, I should probably go into a little bit what, what happened to him after the war. From him being in hospitals and, and being around rehabilitation facilities to try to get his leg working again, he had quite a, um, a long process of healing and um, he was moved by that and he decided to become a physician after the war. So he went to medical school and um, he became quite active in, in his community and he started a sister city program with France to try to make sure that Europe never went to war again. Um, I guess something like that would be hard with the, with the Soviets because of the communist thing that was going on in the Cold War, but he did it in France and he was also honored in the United States and he wrote some books. And uh, the way it got to the Gettysburg Museum of History is really interesting. Um, I, I received a call from his stepson and he called here and he spoke almost perfect English. I, I could barely detect a German accent. And he had said he saw the museum or saw myself on one of the TV shows and, and he cited a storage wars, which I've never done, um, but I believe it was baggage battles. And he said, I understand you like helmets. And I said, yeah, I like helmets. And I, I did a scene on baggage battles on Travel Channel about, um, that involved helmets. And so he said he had this helmet and some other things and he wanted, you know, the family wanted it to go to a museum. And some of the museums in Germany that he had contacted didn't seem to be that interested in it. And of course, we were very interested in it. So he ended up sending it to us and it is now here. And, um, you know, two different German soldiers from that generation, um, you know, that, that almost everyone was affected by war. Um, one had a very tragic outcome of being killed in action and another one being severely wounded in action. But this is a guy that turned that around and turned that tragedy around and actually did some good things later in life. So it's, it's really interesting to see the two different fates of these soldiers. I had a group of German student teachers come in a few years ago and I told them this story of the two different German uh, military men that we have here and their two different fa uh, fates that happened to them. And they were, they were riveted by the story because they said in Germany they don't really talk about this a whole lot, you know, especially the individual soldiers. And um, it, it was a great experience sharing that with those student teachers. All right, so uh, there you have it. The, the story of two men who served under the banner of the Third Reich during World War II, uh, both with uh, really, to me, tragic stories. One who, who died in, in combat, and another one who tried to seek reconciliation later on in life, but probably lived with a lot of guilt uh, throughout his days. And, and you might look at this and say, uh, you know, why would you feel sorry for somebody uh, who committed such evil, or, or why would you have any sympathy? And, and the answer that I would have to that is, is that I, I, I have sympathy and I have pity for anybody who gets caught up in any kind of evil. Um, and and that, that includes the enemy combatants uh, in World War II against the Allies. So anyway, very interesting to, to look at these different artifacts and uh, contemplate the lives of these men.